Introducing Harold Slater, businessman and innovator. The chief among his claims to fame, the artifact that made his name became a must for every home. The light emitting garden gnome. With artistry and microchip, with photo cell and craftsmanship, he built a gnome that won renown for lighting up when the sun went down. Between the hours of dusk and dawn, his gnomes would gleam around the lawn, conferring not just luminescence, George, isn't it lovely? but social status by their presence. It's one up on next door, isn't it? Demand was such throughout the nation. Slater put in automation, raising output ten times over, and reckoned he was now in clover. But fate had other things in store. The wettest spring since 44. It seemed to be interminable, and Harold's gnomes were not impermeable. As one by one, their lights went black, and people yeah, wanted money back. Gnomes has gone on the blink. Said Slater, never to be bested. Henceforth, our gnomes must all be tested. The testers came, set up their gear, and threw dud gnomes out on their ear, creating an inspection section dedicated to rejection. The thing for them that really counted, how high the piles of rejects mounted. It didn't make a lot of sense when costed out in pounds and pence to have a factory making stuff, a half of which was strictly duff. It wasn't worth the time and trouble. If output's halved, you cost a double. When Slater's prices went up fast, his rivals saw their chance at last to seize the market altogether with gnomes resistant to the weather. Combining strength and style and glamour, imported cheap from Yokohama. Their quality and lower prices put Slater in a second crisis. Driven now past all endurance, he turned to quality assurance which says you can't create perfection just concentrating on inspection. Instead, define by written rules, materials, techniques, and tools. And with your inputs all correct, remove the need then to reject. Fault-free gnomes were now produced. Costs and wastage both reduced. Despite his oriental rival, Slater could achieve survival. Or so he thought. But blows of fate were never far from Slater's gate. No sooner was he on the track than Yokohama gnomes struck back. Their new designs, on research-based, took full account of changing taste, giving in their range of choices gnomes with electronic voices. Good morning. It is seven o'clock, please. Hello. Welcome to our lovely home. Please watch feet now. Please to keep your dog off our glass, please. So Slater learned his final lesson that quality is a fine obsession only when it's firmly based on knowledge of the public taste. To rescue Slater's from the lurch, he ordered marketing research to feed designers inspiration based on solid information, making as an innovation gnomes of high sophistication, bigger in imagination. Gnomes that greeted passers-by. Good morning, Mr. Brown. Gnomes that crooned a lullaby. Oh, on the treetops, when the wind blows, the wind blows, the wind blows. Gnomes that sang a rugger song. Four and twenty virgins came down from this Ooh, disgusting. Gnomes that never would go wrong. Quality in every detail, from drawing board to selling retail. There is a science and an art of rightness from the very start. Quality that it's the target of your designated market. Don't buy rubbish by mistake and build it into what you make. Trace all problems back to source before they go from bad to worse. Closely supervise the tools you give your workers. They're not fools. Give them training. Show the way. Quality protects their pay. In other words, it's up to you to diagnose the things you do and put in systems which you see would help improve your quality. Government will take the lead and help to give you what you need. To change, develop and refine and pay off on the bottom line. 
in struggling with Yokohama. Let quality be your shield and armor. Hi, Gav. Hi, George. By the way, what's that huge pile of rubbish by my parking place? Oh, it's uh, taking over, isn't it? Yes. What is it? It's from the factory. Scrap. Scrap? I hear you can get a good price for it. Sherlock Holmes. You good? Yeah. Well, then why aren't you reading it? I'm a bit preoccupied. Tired? Very. I think we're shortly to receive a visitor. Really? How do you know? A handsome cab has just drawn up outside my rooms. A man sprang out and has rung our front doorbell. Remarkable. Elementary, my dear Watson. But when I hear you give your reasons, Holmes, they're always so ridiculously simple. Right, so. Come. Mr. Holmes, you have a visitor. A Mr. Eric Marsh. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Pray come in, Mr. Marsh. And pray be seated. <clears throat> How do you do? Oh. How do you oh. do? <laughs> All that I can deduce at first glance is that you are the managing director and chief executive of a small electrical consumer goods company situated somewhere between London and Brighton that you started on the shop floor and worked your way up, that you're right-handed and short-sighted. How the deuce do you know all that? He's only just come in. Simple. I observe from the state of your hands that you've not done any manual work for some years yet. Your right hand is appreciably larger than your left because its muscles are more developed, indicating that at one time you did manual work. Also, your shoes reveal a mixture of clay and soil found only in the North Weald and stuck to the muddy traces of your soles are small slivers of metal and electrical wiring. 
which must have dropped to the floor as a result of an industrial process. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm not short-sighted. Or perhaps you have not yet fully realized. And you haven't explained how you know that he's the managing director. He is dreaming. I am in his dream. Therefore, everything he knows, I know. Capital! Capital! <laughs> <laughs> Who is this dolt? That is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. You may say before this gentleman anything that you wish. In fact, you will inevitably say things before him because he has not the wit to think of them first. Good God, Holmes! How do you work that out? You know what I mean. Pray, commence. I am, as you rightly observed, the managing director of a subsidiary of Universal International. And I suspect that some sort of swindle is being perpetrated on my company. What sort of swindle? That I don't know. And by whom? That also I don't know. I see. Pray continue. We are gradually losing our market share. Both at home and abroad. If this decline continues, we shall be bankrupt in three or four years. And yet, this loss is inexplicable. Any comments? Well? Clearly, we can't afford to continue this decline. And we're still showing a profit on the year's trading. Not enough, because we're no longer competitive. Peter, should we be advertising more? Well, I don't see how. We're advertising substantially more than all our competitors. I see. Tim. We've put some excellent new designs out in the last 18 months. Customers like the look of them. The uh, toasters, the kettles, the microwaves. He's right. It's easy to sell something that looks nice. Get more stuff out through the gates, we can sell it. No sales resistance? Very little. Look at all the new outlets we keep opening. Fergus, any thoughts? No. Nope. We've done everything. We've cut costs wherever possible. We're buying our components at the cheapest possible prices. But the quality of the product is okay. Absolutely. With more people working in the quality control department than ever before. More than any of our competitors. <sighs> Are these figures misleading, Norman? No, they're right. Well, it seems we're doing everything right, yet losing to our competitors. It's up to you, gentlemen, to look again at what you're doing. And ruthless self-criticism is needed. Group head office warned me that if we don't reverse this trend, heads will roll. And assistant heads. What are the usual reasons for losing your share of the market? Well, you sell less, either because the quality is not good enough, or because you're more expensive than your competitors, or because you have a less good after-sales service. But we're very competitive in all those areas. I'm a detective. I'm interested in motives. What are your motives in coming to see me? Are you trying to improve your quality because the customer is putting pressure on you, or because you want to improve your overall business efficiency? I'm not trying to improve the quality at all. There's no problem with our quality. Watson, I think perhaps that you and I ought to pay a visit to the scene of the crime. superior invention to the toasting fork. I deduce that two slices of bread are put into those two slots, which then produce heat powered by electricity. In about two minutes' time, two slices of toast pop up automatically. Holmes, how did you know that? Oh, shut up, Watson. But why is this electric wire so short? Doesn't it plug into the wall? Um production department asked us to make each flex a foot short. Saves us two or three thousand quid a year, apparently. And what does this saving cost you? Huh? Who was that man 
That was one of our quality control inspectors. They're there to detect any inferior goods. And what do they do if they find any? Reject them, obviously. And what happens to these rejected products? Well, either we sell them as seconds, or the product is broken down and goes back through the manufacturing process. Nothing's wasted, you see. Certainly knows his stuff, Holmes. And how do you control quality other than by inspection? Well, how else can you? What is she doing? She's repairing a component before she inserts it into one of our microwaves. But this is a bought-in component? Yes. But we make sure that no faults get by. Watson, does this not strike you as being a trifle singular? No. I'm completely in the dark. Hello, hello. What have we here? Attractive boxes, don't you think? Hair dryer. Extraordinary. <laughs> but what's wrong with these boxes, pray? Rejected, my dear Watson, obviously. But what can be wrong with boxes? Surely they do not have electric boxes, even in the latter half of the 20th century. These boxes have been rejected because they're not precisely the right color. That's right. I've been meaning to get on to the box manufacturers about that. Very attractive, don't you think? Indeed. Actually, if you don't mind my saying so, it's been designed to look better from a slight distance. I have my methods. This is our customer relations department. Hello, Mr. Marsh. We don't see you here very often. This is Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. As you can see, we're working very hard. We sent out nearly 400 letters yesterday. 400? May one ask what they were about? No oh, answering complaints, warranty claims. We have one of the biggest customer relations departments in the country. Does that mean complaints department? Yes, you can call it that. I see. Watson. I think perhaps we ought to return to Baker Street. It's so sad. You are moved by my music making? Oh, yes, yes, to tears. No, I was referring to the case of the short-sighted boss. Know that? <laughs> Watson, I have no doubt but that we are shortly to achieve some definite result. But I saw nothing to prove who was responsible. Quite so, you see, but you do not observe. <laughs> and yet, I perceive that your eyesight is as good as mine. I have it. I shall attend a board meeting, and I shall pose as a management consultant. And this is Mr. John Smith, who is a management consultant. And his assistant, Dr. Watson. Who is not. Mr. Smith has some questions to ask you. Now, you are Norman Booth, the finance director. I am. I take it that you record the cost of this company of lateness, absenteeism, outputs, and so forth? Well, of course I do. What is the cost of this company of reworking substandard products? Uh, I'm afraid I don't know that. Very well. I presume you know the cost of after-sales servicing, but what percentage is represented by the servicing of avoidable errors? I'm afraid I don't know that either. You don't know? You don't know. Where are the figures? You are the finance director. Well, there are no such figures. So it's all his fault. Sit down. Silence in court. This isn't a court, it's a boardroom. That is totally beside the point in a dream, dolt. 
You are Fergus Mackay, the production director. I am. How many of your products go through the production line twice? About 25%. We try to ensure that all inferior goods are detected, you see. And how many quality controllers have you compared with, say, five years ago? Four times as many. And there are best men. We take no chances. Hmm. Thank you. You may stand down. I think I'll stand up. You are Tim Johnson, the design director? Yes. Tell me why there is a white line round the front of your model EX300 microwave. Market research tells us that the customers like it, and uh, sales improve somewhat when we put it on the market. And how is this white line applied, Mr. Johnson? Uh, well, uh, since we didn't know about this market research when we designed it originally, it took a rather long time to find a way. Uh, eventually, um, after about a year, they discovered that the only way was to uh, actually paint it on between strips of masking tape. As I thought. And you are Peter Marks, the sales director. That's right. What are your views on what you've just heard? Well, Tim's right in a way, but the customers like the look of our products. Mm -hmm. Just get the goods out through the factory gates, that's what I would say. <laughs> Do you indeed? Come here. Is that what you mean? Yes. So what's in this lorry coming in? Uh, that one's bringing back faulty goods that are under our guarantees. And how much does that cost the company? I don't know. It's not my department. And what effect does this have on your repeat sales? Well, not much, I don't suppose. We always honour our guarantees, you see. We are, I fancy, near the end of our quest. Has he found the answer? He has the most immense faculties. Extraordinary powers of observation. He clears up mysteries abandoned as hopeless by the official police. Now I will tell you who is responsible for your missing market share. We are looking for a man of early middle age with thinning hair and a worried expression who carries a pocket calculator and who has a poor head for figures. Sounds like me. <laughs> it is you. The game's up, Eric. Great heavens! Me? You are the chief executive. You alone are responsible for the quality of your product. I'm checking to see what other chief executives have to say on the matter. Uh -huh. seeing this interview on television last week. This is Mr. John Egan, chief executive of Jaguar. You know, the horseless carriage people. Good quality doesn't necessarily need to, to, to cost a lot of money. If you get something right first time, you don't need a lot of inspectors and you don't need a lot of rectifiers. So, for example, um, we halved the number of our in uh, inspectors in our assembly operations um, when we were in the middle of our quality drive. Uh, we did it because we put the responsibility to get it right onto the operator. If he gets it right, then you don't need very many inspectors and you don't need any rectifiers. You can't inspect quality into a product. You have to build it in by getting it right first time. Quality cannot be inspected in. It must be built in. You have all those inspectors, your best people, inspecting instead of producing. What a waste of money and manpower. And those boxes were wasted purely because there was no control of the color process at the beginning. So, they had to be inspected out at the end. Quality controllers alone cannot ensure quality. Quality should be built in all the way through. But we make goods for customers at the lower end of the market. But they want your goods to work, don't they? They don't want to return them under guarantees, even if you do always honor them. Damn nuisance. Look what it costs you. And is it sensible for her to be rectifying a design fault halfway down the line? And look at the cost of painting white lines on microwaves. 
Did you ever ensure that design, sales and production liaised with each other to make sure it was worth it? No. But we're on the margin already. We can't afford any higher quality. <laughs> quality is free. Do you remember what Ian Elliott, Managing Director of Focom Systems, had to say? It hasn't really cost us anything because we've been able to gain all the assistance we needed through the government's consultancy scheme. And we therefore were able to get an outside expert who was able to come in and advise us on what we needed to actually get this incorporated into our business. As a result of this, we've now managed to get it on board and it involves all aspects of, in fact, running the company. It's not just an inspection system. It became very clear to us, anyway, that um, the workforce were going to make a good product because they actually wanted to. And it was because of this kind of enthusiasm that we were able to set up quality circles, uh, which have worked extremely well. A man can be actually doing a relatively dull job on an assembly line, but if he's able, through his quality circle, to influence the way the assembly line is run, then it's a far more interesting job. That's all very well, too. But I constantly speak to my board about this, and it never gets any better. That's not the answer. In, in 1980, 10,500 workers made 14,000 cars. In 1983, just over 8,000 workers made 28,000 cars, which is about a trebling of our productivity on a cars per employee basis. We wouldn't have been able to sell the products, of course, uh, the way they were. So now we have tremendous demand for our product, which is based upon good quality. The fact that we can say we are now incorporating BS5750 is a demonstration to other people that we have something that will meet their requirements. We can actually say that we've got customer orders, yeah. specific orders we can trace back to that. Everybody must have it as their absolutely number one priority that the job of the company is to make a good product. Now, that's the chief executive's job. You see, it's your fault. You're the boss, and a pretty short-sighted one at that. You deduced he was short-sighted right at the start, and he denied it. Oh, well, Inspector Lestrade of the Yard will deal with you now. Please, don't hand me over to the police, I beg you. I promise I'll do better in future. Very well, let's see if you've learnt your lesson. What does the company need? A uh, sustained, profitable business. What does the customer need? Satisfaction with the product. What is quality? Um, quality is fitness for the purpose. Goods and services must totally satisfy the customer. And the whole process must be fit for the purpose. Design, production, sales, dispatch, accounts, after-sales service, the lot. Get it right first time, every time. That's quality. And who must take the lead? Me. It's up to me. It's up to me. It's up to me. It's up to me. I see it now. It's up to me. Poor quality costs the average company 10 to 15 percent of its turnover. It might be costing us 25 percent or more at the moment. Now, if we reduce wastage, we could reduce our prices. Or we could peg our prices and make a larger profit, which would give us more to invest. Well, we've always been happy with a profit of 5 to 10 percent. Exactly. So do you realize that at 25 percent or more, quality costs are probably higher than our annual profits? I'm starting two separate schemes. First, quality assurance for the customer. Second, cost-effective quality management for us. Eric, how did you know what to do? Elementary, my dear Johnson.